Hi, this is this is Eric Prostowski. Welcome to another session of EP on EP. And today we have a wonderful academic and practicing electrophysiologist with us, Dr. Sam Asavatham, who's uh, told me he wants his title to be electrophysiologist of the Mayo Clinic. Talk about a um, underrated title, Sam. <laughs> but but that's what you want to be called. We're going to give it to you. Mm. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, an area of, I think, great clinical importance, still undergoing evolution, and one in which uh, Dr. Asabatham has been one of the leaders, and it's the malignant mitral valve prolapse syndrome. So, Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Sam, let's let's start off with sort of just defining the syndrome. Lots of people have prolapse, but how would you define the malignant uh, mitral valve prolapse syndrome? Thanks, Eric. So, you know, as you know, this uh, malignant mitral valve prolapse syndrome is a diagnosis that sort of came together in an after the fact manner. So one of the early people to recognize this was my colleague, Mike Ackerman, who was actually evaluating patients for possible long QT syndrome. That is people who had uh, unexplained sudden death and who happened to have mitral valve prolapse and didn't have long QT syndrome and started characterizing what is it about those individuals. And that became the form thrust of the syndrome. Instead of all mitral valve prolapse, there was a preponderance of people who had bileaflet mitral valve prolapse and in addition had complex ventricular ectopy. So part morphology, part electrophysiology. And the complexity of this ectopy was either it was frequent, it was more than one morphology with at least one of the morphologies or origin of the PVCs appearing to come from the mitral valve apparatus. The third component was maybe the reason why some of these patients were referred to a long QT clinic is they had abnormal repolarization. The T waves were not normal, they were flat. They were you know, giving the appearance of the QT being longer. So abnormal T waves, frequent ectopy, and bileaflet prolapse, that was where it all kind of started. Since that time, it's been getting more and more defined. And the big addition is the added morphology feature of mitral annular disjunction. So mitral annular disjunction where the mitral valve, instead of being inserted right on the annulus, is actually inserted on the atrium, giving rise to some abnormal type tissue that's ventricular to the point of attachment of this annulus. So it's kind of like an inverse of the Epstein anomaly, where instead of being the tricuspid valve too ventricular, the mitral valve is too atrial. And this is usually kind of the tetrad of like malignant mitral valve prolapse. But within the syndrome, there have been three additional features that have been brought to light. You know, one is it's not just complex ventricular ectopy, but polymorphic non-sustained VT. So there's a PVC and then a couple others changing axis or morphology. Uh, and the last has been imaging with MRI that shows abnormal late cadenlinium enhancement, usually in the submitral apparatus, papillary muscle walls around the area of the mitral valve. But in some patients, nothing even close to the mitral valve suggesting that what really they may be having is a cardiomyopathy. And as part of that cardiomyopathy, they have abnormal support to the mitral valve. So today it's varying contributions from each of these that we'd call malignant mitral valve prolapse syndrome. That's a great overview, Sam. Let me let you dig down a little bit into this though. And, and let's, let's start um, with the MAD, the mitral annular disjunction. I really hadn't paid much attention to that over the years. Um, for me, it was a more recent observation. Obviously, 
it's been around, I'm sure, for years. But the earlier descriptions, and even my experience with patients over the years who, who unfortunately had a cardiac arrest with mitral valve prolapse, it was very bilious valves, right? And uh, they would have that fibrosis under the uh, leaflets and the earlier descriptions. But ha it's a change now, right? In other words, I remember reading your papers and others uh, and, uh, that you don't really have to have dramatic mitral regurgitation as part of the syndrome. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yes. So uh, the, the bileaflet prolapse, large floppy valves probably play a role in uh, the ectopy just from contact, just hitting against the outflow tract, back and the annulus on the papillary muscles. This would be Barlow's contact lesions, for example. But the extent of regurgitation is not a predictor for malignant nature of uh, ventricular arrhythmia. So really those decision-making for what to do with the valve kind of goes in parallel uh, based on the regurgitation, do you need surgery? And how much is the valve morphology itself contributing to the ectopy? And then there's this knotty problem of the MAD. Um, you mentioned it's part, it could be part of the syndrome, but there are good data out there showing patients who have only MAD and have suffered a cardiac arrest. Um, how do you, you know, you know so much about the anatomy. You've done a lot of work in this area. Mm -hmm. How do you put that together? Is this a form thrust? Is it part of a spectrum? How do you look at that? Is it okay to draw a quick picture here? Uh, if you can do it, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if this is atrium, this is ventricle, and this is mitral valve normal. Mitral valve prolapse would be in systole, it's billowing back like this. If instead of this point of attachment, it's attached right there, then even if it's not billowing back, it's still prolapse. So by definition, this displacement would have been something just called prolapse in years gone by. It's just the mechanism is different. It's actually the point of attachment is further back. Now this tissue here is actually like atrial tissue, but it's a continuum and it uh, seems to give rise to arrhythmias, both atrial arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias. So it's hard to envision mitral annular disjunction without some kind of prolapse. But if, if in patients with prolapse, there's annular disjunction, this is becoming clearer and clearer that that is an important risk factor. And in fact, in the patients, which is a small minority who've had ablation studies, the arrhythmia, the abnormal electrograms, the site of ablation, is often right underneath this disjuncted uh, valve. That's great. Uh, that's wonderful, Sam. Well, let's go now to, to the more practical problem, I think, of when, when and how to screen for patients who, uh, who may be at risk for sudden death. Um, as you well know, any person who's been in the business for a while and gets sent patients, it's so common to see you know, uh, an echo report with mitral valve prolapse. And it's, you know, it might be minimal, right? Um, and then you sometimes see uh, the usual seven millimeter MAD on a report and the patients are asymptomatic. So wh wh I guess the question for you is, and I know kind of what I do, but I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about your approach. When, when do you start to delve in and say, hey, I've got to look at something else? Because I, I think you would agree with me. You can't do MRIs on every patient. There's got to be, a way that you select out those. So, so give us your approach yeah. when you get you you start to say, "Hey, I've got to do more." Yeah, of course. The easy case is when someone has had a malignant event already or a malignant sounding event. So we'll forget about those. So to me, like there has to be either worrisome symptoms, worrisome arrhythmia, or worrisome morphology. Usually, a mix of more than one. So. Most common patient where this would be is they knew about mitral valve prolapse maybe already, but now start getting palpitations. And if you did a Holter monitor or monitored them, 
they either have frequent or close coupled or polymorphic ectopy. And that would definitely be an alert level to say mitral valve prolapse plus complex ectopy need to look more carefully. So maybe MRI, maybe more carefully defining how much non-disjunction there is, how much disjunction there is and so on. The other is occasional patients. And, you know, I would say this may be 10% of the patients uh, just guessing is they never really complained of palpitations that much that doesn't bother them. But for some reason they got monitored or had a stress test and had a very malignant looking polymorphic VT that spontaneously stopped. Patient hardly felt it. But when you and I would look at it, you know, this is like a scary arrhythmia, you know, clearly polymorphic, rapid. And then they have mitral annular disjunction, they have mitral valve prolapse. Those are patients who at least need careful counseling to state both what we know and don't know about the syndrome and to consider a defibrillator, at least consider MRI. And in some patients where it's a tough call, there's some symptoms, malignant looking arrhythmia, but MRI is equivocal, could even consider an EP study to see uh, is there sustained arrhythmia that's inducible. We're going to get into treatment in part two of your of your interview, Sam. So let's hold off on that. Let me just ask you something that I've been doing only because uh, I've been interested in this, as I think you know, we've talked about it over the years for probably the better part of a couple of decades um, before it was more well-defined, only because I had some patients sent to me and, and um, had not done well, and I tried to look into it. In, in my own experience, and tell me if this is something you agree with as far as a, as far as a easy screen, I haven't found any patient yet with normal T waves in two, three, and AVF who fit the malignant pattern. That's just been my experience. I don't know if that's yours. Um, I don't mean they have to have be you know deep downward T waves, but I've never. I just haven't seen a patient that's totally normal two, three, and F. Um, and so I I sort of use that as a initial screening test, but what's your experience been? That's very interesting. You know, I think it's all, most patients with the syndrome do have funny looking T waves, you know, but I've never really thought about the opposite. Does a normal T wave uh, kind of say low risk? It makes a lot of sense. I've just not paid attention to that, it from that angle. So, so now I've given you yet one more Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting, it's very interesting uh, way to so, look at. So Sam, I'm going to stop at this point only because I want to regroup with you um, um, for part two and discuss therapy. Thank you as always for being so informative to our audience. Thank you very much.